Welcome to the Alpha Genix Podcast, where every week we talk to incredible guests from around the world of biohacking, well being, men's health, and more. Here's your host, co founder of Alpha Genix, Ross Tompkins. Well, I'm absolutely delighted today to introduce a really special guest, Dr. Jordan Grant from all the way over in the US and our very own Dr. Max Draper. Welcome, guys. Hello. Thanks, Ross. So um, Max has been on our channel before, probably doesn't need any introduction. But um, Jordan, do you want to go into a little bit of a, a bit of detailed background, how you ended up in this space? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a it, I'll try to condense the story. Um, so I'm a urologist by training and by practice for three more weeks. Um, I got into hormones, which we were talking about kind of in the pre-show when I was, I don't know, 17, 18, uh, 1997, 98. You know, Internet was fresh and, uh, you you know, you see the guys at the gym, they're looking swole and you kind of like, I want to know what they're doing. Um, so I started looking into anabolic steroids back then and I was, you know, I had like a insatiable appetite about hormones. It just fascinated me how powerful they were, um, what you could accomplish with them. And so I really started looking into that before I ever took anything, um, you know, because most guys don't do that when they're 18. They're just like, hey, take this, bro, and get big. And I, I wasn't going to do that. I was like, OK, I need to know how these work. What are the different what is everything? And so I spent probably a good six or eight months just researching anabolics. And before I ever did my first, you know, quote unquote, cycle. Um, and I dabble with that on and off in college. Um, and then I just kind of stop, you know, you, you get out of college and life hits you and I just didn't stick with that. Um, but I always had that passion for that topic. And I learned a lot, even during college from the message, the old message boards back in the day were awesome, you know, before nine 11, especially, um, you know, there was this open information about all this stuff and you just start picking things up from sort of the veterans of these groups online. Um, and you pick out and, and I, I didn't know what was right, what was wrong. You just kind of, you're just soaking it all up. And so time goes on. Um, I was kind of a non-traditional person. I didn't go straight into med school after college. I actually had a finance degree and, and worked in sales and use tax consulting for a year and hated it. And, I decided I wanted to be a doctor, so I had to go back and start all over. So I had to do three, three and a half years of prerequisites just to get into medical school. So I started medical school at 27. Uh, I got in uh, to Texas Tech. And, um, you know, the, after a couple of years, you kind of got to decide what you want to do. And uh, I didn't know, you know, I didn't really I knew I wanted to help people. I, I still had that like hormone thing in the back of my head. And uh, I was like, what can I do? How can I treat hormone replacement? How can I do that? And I thought, well, urologists do that, you know, and they do surgery. So it's like, that's cool. Um, Cause everybody thought I'd be an orthopedic surgeon just cause I, I worked out. I was kind of, you know, whatever, you know, you don't see a lot of like fit people in medical school necessarily that often. So they're like, Oh, you'll be an ortho. And I'm like, no, that's not for me. Uh, I'm not really the fraternity guy type of personality. Um, and so I looked into urology. I did some rotations. I loved it. I was like, this is, these surgeries are so cool. You know, you're doing robotic surgery and stone surgery and all this plus the hormone side. So I was like, I could maybe use that one day. So got into a urology residency, uh, by the grace of God, cause it's so competitive and did a five year residency in that. And even during residency, I started, we have our own clinics, you know, they'll, they'll give you kind of your own patients to start kind of training you and you have a, an attending over you that's kind of watching what you do but i would start doing testosterone replacement and it was kind of the general like i did you know once a week injection but it, it was better than what they were doing for people which was every two week injection and all this stuff they're kind of looking at me like who what is he doing why is he doing this and why is he so passionate nobody gets it like because you're not trained in urology even residency about hormone replacement like you'll get the general yeah, I give a shot every two weeks type of thing and tell them to donate blood if their hematocrit gets over X level. And that's pretty much it. Like it's it's very short lived. And I don't think most people really realize how little for, truly good training people get in hormones, um, whether in med school or residency. So I got out and did urology. Uh, we did two years in Shreveport, Louisiana in private practice there. Um, and it was kind of a nightmare as far as like the financial situation of the clinic. And we, we, we saw some red flags. There's just a lot going on that we didn't want to be a part of. And so we got out of there uh, and moved here to Paris, Texas. And we've been here for five years and been doing general urology. Um, 
but I started my hormone stuff in Shreveport. I started really trying to get better and better at hormone replacement, you know, still doing the once a week thing and finally started telling guys to do twice a week because I'd noticed they were telling me, hey, after five days, I'm crashing. And, and just to tell you, I started TRT during residency when I was 34. So and I knew about the twice a week thing. I just didn't think patients would be willing to do it. So I started out, you know, 100 milligrams twice a week, test sip, felt fine. Like that was it. And so and I just because I already knew from my steroid days that you need to split it up and keep your levels stable. So anyway, coming here, you know, kept refining things. I got involved with the, the Facebook groups. And one of them was the TRT and hormone optimization group, which uh, has become pretty popular. Um, Steven Devos, it's his group. He's a dermatologist. And, um, you know, we tried to start really, there were, there were some good physicians in there that were part of like Jay Campbell's uh, round table videos and stuff. And they were talking about things I'd never really even heard of. They were talking about not using aromatase inhibitors. They were talking about the benefits of estradiol, like all these little nuanced things that a lot of people just, don't talk about because I was always under the impression you got to take an aromatase inhibitor, even though when I took one, I felt like death. And I finally stopped taking it after I, don't know, I finally learned my lesson, probably after like five years, I would take it on and off. Um, you know, I just I never really put two, and two together because I wasn't in my element yet as far as questioning things and questioning other people and going, how do you know that I need to prove that I wasn't there yet. And finally started getting there, you know, probably four or five years ago. And I heard a it was a podcast or a video with Jay Campbell with Neil Ruzier. And it was like a three part series on estradiol and why you don't need to block estradiol. And it was, I saw it in professional muscle forum, which is a steroid forum. And um, these guys were all talking about it. And I was like, man, I need to look into this. So I started looking at the research papers and all that. And that's where we kind of took off in the group and started talking about these things. And I started getting in fights online with guys about their aromatase inhibitor use. And I'm like, come see me and let's get you off of it. And let's see if you feel better. And guys would start traveling here to see me because they were, they didn't feel good, but they still felt like they needed these, you know, toxic medicines. And so that's sort of where I started carving out my passion. I think for, for this was, was treating guys, getting them off their AIs, being willing to dial in their dose based on their symptoms and not just their numbers and just taking it from there. And, and once you treat enough people that way, you know, you get hundreds and hundreds of guys you start kind of getting a feel for it. And, and I was able to speak out more in the forum uh, about that. And, and more and more guys have, have started doing that, more providers, I think. So that was a long winded way of giving an introduction. And I'm sorry, but kind of gives you the kind of the picture of what got me here. You know, so it's it's been a yeah. good journey. I lo love it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, I, like I've said before on 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 this channel, the the TRT hormone optimization and, and, and Dr. Grant, their work over the last sort of three years of me learning more and more about TRT, particularly the practical aspects as well as the science has been, you know, just so incredibly useful. I think it's a really sort of incredible um, job that they're doing there just to get the word out there and explain the science as well as how to actually apply that practically. So from my perspective, it's a real honor to be on the channel, you know, today with him, just because he's someone who I've followed for a, a good few years now and uh, been really impressed with the work, and it, all of it, really. I appreciate that. It's it's crazy to hear that because I just never thought, I, I, I don't know, you know, when you're younger, you don't know where your life's going to take you. You just know you have a passion for something and you always wanted to be, I don't want to be somebody necessarily. It's not about limelight. It's I want to do the right thing for people and I want to be whatever I do, I want to do it the right way. I'm very kind of OCD about certain things. I'm not really an OCD person in other ways, but I can't, they call it what a type one personality on the Enneagram thing. I'm, I'm very like black and white, you know, and if I go in, I'm all in. And it's the same with topics that I research. I'm, I'm all in. I want to digest it until I fully understand it. Then I move on. Not that I know all this stuff. I don't. Um, but I'm passionate about it. And I think people see that and my patients have told me that. And so I think that does reflect in, how I respond to people on Facebook groups and stuff. Um, I try to rein in a lot of the nonsense, I think. Um, and people appreciate that guys who are, especially if you're like a free thinker, a critical thinker, you can appreciate that because there's so many people that will just start blowing up with some story about why they feel a certain way or this and that. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How do you know that? Where did you give, come up with that? Can you give me evidence for that? And people are like, whoa, evidence. I don't have to give you evidence for that. I'm like, yeah, you do. I mean, you know, you, you really do, especially in these kind of discussions, you know, we're talking about 
hormones and, and medicine and all these things, which I know there's a lot of gray area and things that you can't prove one way or the other, but at least have a, re a good reasoning for what you're saying and don't start spewing nonsense that might actually hurt somebody, you know, unless you've got, you know, if you've got good evidence, I'll change my mind on something. I promise you that if you can give it to me, if you, you know, and so guys come in there and say, you need to block estrogen. And I go, how do you know that? How do you even know? I'll go, how do you, and we can get into this whole AI stuff if y'all want to, but you know, how do you even know that the blood test for estradiol is telling you what you think it tells you? And they're like, they don't even know what to do with that. They don't know how to process that question. And I'm like, you might want to start there before you start spewing and telling guys they need to take a breast cancer medication, right? Like at least have some reasoning for that. Um, and so I think people pick up on that. And I think more and more the groups become kind of like that. It's like, you got to back up what you say with some evidence. Like, you know, it's fine if you just say it's my personal opinion. It's my belief. That's fine. We all have those. You know, but but when it comes to some of these topics, I feel like, you know, if you're giving the positive claim that you have to do X, especially if it's something that's harmful, like taking an AI or frequent blood donations and some of this stuff, you better back that up. And if you don't back it up and you start becoming a jerk, you're going to get booted from the group really quick. I mean, it really it is that simple. Like we don't tolerate I don't tolerate BS. I don't. I'm, I'm happy to have a, an adult conversation with people. But if, if you just if you make a positive claim and we ask you for backup and you start spewing personal insults, which most people do, you're, you're done. So the group gets kind of like it stays like kind of weeded out with a lot of the insane people that come from a lot of these other Facebook groups, you know, where I've been kicked out of just for asking questions, you know, years ago. Like, well, how do you know that? And that's booted me out for even asking. It's kind of funny to see the flip side of that. Why do you think what you mentioned about being passionate about hormones from a from a, a, a sort of fairly young age there, you know, in your in your late teens? And it seems to be that the people who who practice TRT or, or you know, as doctors, clinicians, practitioners, they've all either been on TRT themselves or they've had experience with hormones and everything like that. Is this because you commented that you don't get taught this in residency, you don't get taught this through medical school? I certainly learned very little about testosterone. The only thing in GP training was if you have someone comes in with erectile dysfunction, you might want to check testosterone. That's the only area it was mentioned in. Is that why you think that, you know, it seems like everybody who I talk to about testosterone who has done this for a good while is either on it themselves or has experience with hormones? Yeah. I mean, and it's not, it's different maybe in the U S I'm not sure. Cause everybody and their dog is trying to prescribe hormones now and they don't know anything about it. I hate to say that. Um, doctors will do it. Doctors, most doctors, if they don't have a passion for it, they will still prescribe these things, but they hate it. If you ever get involved in any doctor physician groups, like they're not really hormone related groups, but you'll they'll, every now and then they'll bring up something about testosterone. If people knew what their doctors talk, said about them when it comes to their hormones, they'd be appalled. Um, these these doctors blow these people off like they're making things up. They just want to have more sex. They just want to get big when we know that's not the case. Right. So those side of things, I'd say the majority of doctors, that's their mindset because they see these as steroids. They see any kind of performance enhancement as wrong. Yet they'll prescribe crap to people that make them worse all the time. Like it's the weirdest dichotomy in the world as far as the cognitive dissonance goes. But I think as far as those of us that are actually passionate about it, yeah, we've either, I think, dabbled in performance enhancement stuff in the past. You kind of already have a feel for hormones and then you end up needing TRT because you dabbled in the past. Um, or you just have a, a passion for seeing people get start to feel better. And then when you start doing these things, you see patients come to you and go, man, doc, I feel like a new person. And that's like, holy cow, I'm doing something right. I want to keep doing that. And those people, even if they're maybe not on it, will have a vested interest and hopefully we'll start going down these paths to find the right way to do things. And we see more practitioners join our group that are like kind of in that boat. They're not necessarily on it, but they're like, I'm doing something right. I'm starting to be a little more open-minded and listen to my patients. That's the key, right? That's the key that people tell me. They're like, doc, you just listen to me. Like I'm a human being. I'm like, well, why wouldn't I? Right? Like, cause that's me. Like I'm that guy. I'm the guy on TRT that needed it at 34 and, I knew, I mean, I was lucky because I was in residency. So I just went to one of my cooler attendings and was like, hey, can you write me a prescription for testosterone? Because I'm at 300 and I feel like crap. He's like, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, but most 34-year-olds can't do that. You know, they have to find somebody like us that's going to actually listen to them. 
um, and, and not fill their head with nonsense. But it's so I, I don't know the answer because I still can't figure out why so many are there's such a stigma against it. You know, I've been asked that. I did a, a podcast with Amy Stuttle. She owns Victory Men's Health Clinics, um, three or four of those, and she's great. And for a, for a non-medical person, I mean, she goes to conferences, she knows hormones inside and out. Like she's passionate about it. Right. And she was asking me, what is this kind of stigma? And I don't have a good answer for it. I don't know what it is. It's so frustrating because doctors, they'll be dogmatic in their ignorance. They will spew nonsense to patients about testosterone. That's literally just made up. And I can't figure out why they do that. It's, um, but that's why we do what we do, right? Like, that's why we're here to have a this like voice in the wilderness to say, here's what's actually happening. Here's why these patients come. Here's them getting better. You know, you put that up against their chronic BP management that doesn't do anything for them and they stay obese and all this. And the primaries are just scratching their head going, I don't know why these guys you know, want to go over there. I'm like, why would, how do you not get that? You know, it's crazy. I don't know if you have the same experience over there or not. Yeah, it's it's really it's a, it's a strange. I always say this to Ross. It's a strange world to or to. It's a strange space to occupy, because you you look at testosterone replacement treatment, and you know, being I've been around medicine now for what sixteen, eighteen years, including med school, and I don't, I can't think of a treatment which does more than testosterone does. If you have you know inadequate testosterone and you go on good TRT. I don't think there's one treatment that you can say is as good as testosterone. Do you see what I mean? And, and so we have, a, we have two elements to it where there's this stigma against it. But on the other side of the equation, it's kind of like, well, go through the list of benefits of TRT and then give me another medication that does the same thing. Yeah. I don't think there is one. I agree. Which is, so it's a really odd um, stigma against it when it's almost like, I remember seeing a TRT hormone optimization uh, video recently about SHBG, and I can't remember the guy's um, name in it, but he says, I don't believe in miracles, but if there is one miracle drug, it's testosterone. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind yeah. of like, you know, yeah. you can see the reasoning there. Yeah. It's a very strange thing. I say that all the time. We talk about testosterone, just the, the positives, the, the myriad of positives and minimal negatives if you do it right, you know, and there's nothing else like that. Um, and, even in guys that don't have a deficiency, you know what I mean? Like if they have symptoms, cause we treat now, I treat guys based on their symptoms and that's very controversial. I don't know why, because GPs do that with depression and all this, you know, they'll give SSRIs or SNRIs for symptoms. Um, there's no deficiency there that they're measuring. Uh, and, and, and we know those medicines don't actually fix their depression. They just sort of like numb people, but testosterone on the other hand, you give it to somebody even if they don't have a deficiency, they're going to still feel better. They're going to perform better. They're going to, but what I see it as, it's not just a band aid. Cause a lot of people say, well, you're just, I mean, why not just take cocaine and feel better? It's like, okay, I get, I get your point, but cocaine, number one, can be very harmful and kill you. Number two though, like we all do things to better our lives, even when we don't have quote unquote deficiencies in an area, I guess. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong to me, at least philosophically, taking something that is overall going to make you, it's going to amplify what you do and make you a better person when it, I'm not saying morally, but I'm saying like your motivation for things, your, your drive, all the things that men especially want to do as they get older, they start, the world just beats them down and they don't want to do the things that they really do want to do internally. It's just like, I don't want to get out of this chair. You know, I'm working my job that I'm told I have to do it this way my whole life. And my, wife is blah 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 i mean all this stuff that's coming at them and you go hey let's try a little testosterone and just see if we can get you eating right back in the gym and all of a sudden in six months they've dropped 30 pounds they're a better husband they're playing softball or playing catch with their kids like and i know this sounds crazy to people that hear it they're like it's not it, i hear these stories all the time this happens all the time to my patients and it's nothing i'm doing that's special i'm just listening to them and willing to go, hey, let's try this. Let's see if you feel a little better doing this and let's do it the right way. Let's keep your blood level stable. I'll put you on protocols that are going to actually castrate you. Not do stupid things. You know what I mean? So 
And that's all there is to it. It really is that simple. Um, it's, it's just this little simple formula and you get guys feeling better and they are just so grateful. And then they get their wives go calling up my wife going, hey, can you check my wife's hormones and have her talk to, you know? And then you get everybody on the same page and they're like, they're new people, honestly. I mean, cause they've just been down here for so long. And um, anyway, sorry, I, I can go off on tangents about this stuff. I'm just, like I said, I'm pretty passionate about it because it does, like you say, it, it's amazing how well it works. And I don't know any other thing you could take that can have that many positives from it with so few negatives. I just don't. Mm. It, it almost sounds too, too good to be true, doesn't it? When you list all the benefits, yeah, people are like, that's not right. Surely not. It does. And, 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 it, and I'll be honest, you do have to be careful. And it, this is with anything in life, right? It's all about setting expectations up front. If you've got a guy that comes in who thinks he's going to get on 200 milligrams of testosterone a week and and look like Arnold Schwarzenegger in six months or something, you know what I mean? Or I want to get on testosterone because I want to have sex every day. And because my libido, it's like that's not realistic, you know, so you you do have to set expectations with patients. And that's where the one on one comes in. Whereas a lot of these giant clinics, uh, and I don't know you know, all of them, but, you know, a lot of them, they're not talking to the physician like that one-on-one. -on -one. They're seeing just a nurse, not that just a nurse practitioner, because nurse practitioners can be great too. Doctors are crap too, but they're, they're getting somebody who doesn't really care. They're just like, here's your medicines. Good luck. And they're not actually talking to them. Like what's going on? What's, what's your sleep like? What's your marriage like? What's your diet like? Are you working out? Like you've got to start getting that full picture, that holistic picture of the person too. And then I think that does help you, number one, set expectations. Like it's all psychology at first. When you're with a patient, you're becoming, you know, like a confidant with them, like an almost like a counselor in a way. Um, that's how I feel, at least with my guys is like we're, we're like bros, right? Like we're talking it out like you would just like, hey, what's what's going on, man? Like, let's talk about it. And that's what I love about it, because it's not coming in going, I want to get bigger. It's coming in going. I feel like crap and I, I, I don't want to play with my kid or, or, or my wife is mad at me because, you know what I mean? Like, and those start taking on a lot of meaning and you're like, I want to help you. I mean, and so it's just, it's really, I don't know where I was going with that, but it's really satisfying. And is, I think as long as you listen to the patient and then set expectations up front, you're not going to help a hundred percent. There's always going to be a few where whatever you try because if they're like a super anxious person, I mean, and we see it in the Facebook group all the time, like some of these guys are so anxious about every single thing that happens in their life. I don't know that testosterone can even overcome that. I mean, I had a guy come to me and I finally, you know, this was like five, four years ago. He drove up from like New Orleans area, which is like eight hours. And um, he was on an aromatase inhibitor. We got him off of that. We talked him through that because he was already convinced he didn't need it. But he's like, OK, doc, here's my mood journal. And he was literally journaling every single emotion that he had like every day. And I was like, you need to throw that in the trash because every time you have a weird emotion or something you don't like, you're going to start trying to link that to your hormone protocol and go, oh, it must be my estrogen or it must be. The, and, and guys do that all the time. It's like, no, it's called life. Life still happens. You just got to learn, take the testosterone. That's your new base. And then you learn to tackle these issues from the human side, from the psychology side and the spiritual side, the mental health side, like the hormones aren't going to overcome, you know, you fighting with your wife or whatever, but they may help you, you know, feel better when you do tackle those things. So again, I think for me, at least, you know, expectations are everything, just like in surgery, like we set expectations up front, but the patients who don't have that, they'll get a surgery and start having some issues or whatever. And if the surgeon never let them know that was coming, they're like, they're scared to death. Whereas like if I tell them up front, OK, expect this in the first few days, expect this in the next few weeks, then usually they're at least a little more comfortable when those things do happen. So. So I, I got from that that I'm not going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to change. I'm going to have to change my dose that, at this. That was my goal, man. Like I was, <laughs> up, I was a, a kid like obsessed with the, you know, that generation, right. With Arnold and, and Sylvester Stallone. And so I wanted to look like those guys. I think that's part of why I was so obsessive with hormones once I got into that. Cause I, I did want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, until I found yeah. out it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it it kind of makes me laugh when, you know, you hear people say you know, they're they're taking steroids. You know, when we we're now talking about the the bros down the gym, the big guys, are they, they're taking steroids, they're cheating, and you're like, 
they might be taking in something to enhance, but they're not sitting on the sofa to look like that. The no. discipline and dedication required to be that way is amazing. Yes. Like it's then, yeah, they're not eating pizza and just injecting themselves once a day. Like no. that is not how it happens. No. I mean, you might get an outlier that's just genetically where they just respond to whatever they take and they can do nothing. And you will see that. And I, I remember guys like that in high school. And that's what got me like, oh, how did that guy turn into Superman in six weeks? You know, but that's <laughs> not the norm. You know, when I took stuff, I didn't do it right. I didn't know how to work out at that time, really. You know, just, I, yeah, I'd grow a little bit, but I didn't end up getting fat, look like a Michelin man, you know? I mean, it was just stupid. Or I'd be bloated or whatever. Whereas now that I've gotten older and I know how to train and eat, you know, it, little goes a long way. But you're right. Like the dedication to be a bodybuilder, I mean, I get it. It's a strange, like people don't like it because it's weird, right? Like it's, it's a very strange little niche, but those guys are obsessive and their their discipline is insane. Um, what they have to just go through with the amount of food they eat and the amount of drugs they take. And I know people are like, well, okay, yay. But yeah, it's, they're putting their bodies through and it's not healthy, you know, but they are mentally, they're on it. They're dedicated. I mean, it's insane to see what they have to do, but I think people equate that with TRT and it's just like, you can't do that. It's not even in the same you know, universe, honestly. Mm -hmm. And this whole steroid thing it drives me nuts. What was it yesterday? Mm -hmm. I saw on Facebook, one of these, mega hormone clinic advertisements and some guy on there talking about steroids versus peptides and natural versus synthetic and all this. And then it just, it pissed me off so much because I was like, first of all, yes, testosterone is a steroid, but so is cortisone. So is estradiol who gives a crap if it's called a steroid. That just means it's derived from cholesterol. Secondly, anything you're taking that's made by a human is synthetic. It's synthetic by definition, what it means. They try to hoodwink people with this nonsense, like, oh, peptide's natural. No, it's not. You didn't go out in nature and find a peptide. They made that, and you're injecting it, right? Like, injecting things isn't natural. So don't, it just drives me nuts when they try to hoodwink people with that stuff. So I think this, this, this stigma does come from both sides. But from the doctor side, it's out of ignorance. And from the bro side, they're trying to sell you something, right? With that kind of crap right there. And so I think we try to like negotiate through all this crap and go, here's actually what that word means. Here's what you're, you know what I mean? Like that, at least for me. And I think a lot of people appreciate that when you're like, hey, thank you for just being honest. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm imagining like little streams of peptides out in the jungle somewhere yeah. and you yeah. can go and scoop oh, it up. Oh, there's some BPC 157 over there. Let me go scoop <laughs> it up. It's like, it doesn't work like that. It's crazy. That was what I found when I was, I was learning about this stuff over the last couple of years is you have to be really careful because you'll see even like YouTube videos from people. And actually when you delve into it, it's not necessarily science. It's a, it's a sales piece for their clinic. You know, they'll say, you have to do, everybody has to take testosterone and HCG and this and this and this. Otherwise, you're not going to get the best results. And it's kind of like, if you just take testosterone, they would imply that, you know, you're going to die. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, and I'd be like, is this scientific? And then you'd end up sort of actually looking into it and be like, I don't think this actually stands up the test to science. Yeah. You know, it, it, so it's a bit, it's actually a bit of a jungle out there when you're actually looking into it. You're trying it, to apply it, the science practically as well. Yeah, and it gives everybody a bad name, which I hate that because I'm not into the genetic fallacy stuff, guilt by association. You know, but I get it because people are going to be more hesitant to seek out a TRT, you know, a TRT because all they hear is the BS and nonsense, or they go to these clinics. Like, you know how many guys eventually found their way to me who had originally gone somewhere else or gotten pellets or something. And they just, they come in, they go, yeah, testosterone just never worked for me. And I'm like, it wasn't testosterone that didn't work for you. It was your provider that didn't work for you, you know, because they just were trying to sell you pellets or try to sell you some BS or fear monger you on the opposite side of things, you know? So it is a minefield. Um, but that's why we do what we do in the Facebook group. Like it's not just to help patients. It's for when, if other providers come in there and want to really try to kind of have a new way of thinking about stuff. That's what I love is like seeing these other newer providers come in and go, man, I, I like this, this, this aligns with my philosophy. And so then they start asking questions and I got people that'll message me on Facebook and Hey, what do you think about this or whatever? And we, we collaborate and talk about it. And that's, what's so fun about this stuff, you know, is that you're, you're trying to, to fashion like a new and better way to do it that's not going to harm people and only hopefully help people and and make you a better 
provider at the same time because you learn how to listen to your patients and you start developing relationships with people like and that's why we're doing what we're doing that's why i'm leaving urology and opening you know grant hormone and wellness but and i'm not wanting a big clinic like i i've already told my wife and i both were like i get three or four hundred patients we're done like that's it and i already have more than that at your in urology but i don't know how many are going to come but this to me is about a small community type thing. And I mean, everybody's got their goals and I get it. We just don't want to hire anybody. It just wants to be me and her, right? Like, so we don't want to hire anybody else. Uh, so we got to keep it kind of small, but I love my one-on-one. -on -one. Like I develop friendships with these guys. And when I see them on a telemedicine call, you know, and I'll see them again in six months. And, and I remember what we talked about the last time. And then we start chatting about that. I mean, we rarely talk about the hormone part. It's really the first 10 minutes is, working out or doing this or this is going on in my life. And then I'm like, hey, hi, by the way, how are you feeling on your testosterone? You know, and they're like, feel great. And I'm like, OK, cool. You know, it's, <laughs> it's so great. Yeah, it really is. What inspired the what, what what was the end point at which you decided to actually fully leave the, the urology field? Oh, man. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I just say I left I left general practice very recently um, just to do this full time. And it was kind of. It, I just say that I felt like general practice had lost its full appeal to me and that this, since I started doing it about, I don't even know long, how long ago was it? About a year maybe? That that was just kind of like eye-opening. You know, like you said, you get the time with people. I think I think sort of fairly similar experience with patients where you do end up, you know, you talk about the actual treatment and then for 20 minutes, I'll just start banging on about, you know, the world or yeah. how's the exercise going, you know, Oh, you're getting it. You know, you're getting this surgery done in the near future, all this stuff. Don't let them tell you to stop your testosterone, <laughs> that sort of thing. You know? Yeah, man. That's a great question. Like, and I've been feeling this. I knew, I think when I, I'll just be honest, when I got in out of residency and I really started doing more testosterone stuff, even in Shreveport, I kind of knew deep down, um, I didn't have the passion for urology per se. Um, I hate taking call. I hate it. I, I literally would rather gnaw my arm off than take call. Um, I, and so that's been a big one here, especially because between me and my wife, both being urologists, we're on call 20 days a month. So we've gotten to do nothing as far as getting really involved, doing fun things on a weeknight. I mean, you just can't do it. Um, so that's I don't like anybody having uh, their thumb on me and call owns you. And I don't like that. Um, but there's so many factors with medicine that, that made me want to be out of the the system, quote unquote. The hormone side was one. Um, but over here, it may be like there, the 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 government control of everything, honestly, the insurance model, the corporate medicine and everybody, you know, they blast. They'll call it capitalism. And it's not capitalism. Like all these hospitals are controlled. You know, they're all in cahoots, basically, with the government and Medicare and CMS and all this. They control everything. So CMS sets the standard for even reimbursement rates for the private insurance companies. So they're all following whatever the government tells them to do. Um, and regardless, it's just not a good system for people. Um, I got so sick of that side of it, too, you know, that playing the insurance games and them balking at, at covering a certain surgery. Um, and then the hospital side of things, and I'm not knocking my current employer because they're not any different really than any other big hospital system. Um, they've been great to us, honestly. Like they, they really being in a small town helps, <clears throat> you know. But you know these hospital systems, you know, we're they're now owned by a giant hospital system out of Nashville, Tennessee, and then has 90 hospitals across the country. So you start getting the the count, accountants essentially start running the show from Nashville, you know, whatever. And it's the same with any of these big systems, and you start want to bang your head through a wall because you're like, I'm the one taking care of these patients. These are, this is me and the patient. It's not, they're not numbers on a spreadsheet. And I told that to one of our lower level managers and they're local and she got it. I mean, she was just doing her job trying to come by and say some stuff. And I'm like, I'm not going to do what you're telling me to do. Number one, number two, these patients are not just numbers on a spreadsheet, right? These are people and we're the ones that take care of them. And I got so sick of just that constant battle. And so there was that side of it. There was the nonsense that's gone on the last three and a half years with a lot of stuff that really just I, I don't want to be a part of that system if I can help it. Um, there's so many things that went into this decision for us. You know, the I always knew I really wanted to just do hormone optimization, lifestyle optimization only. But I think the last three to four years really just helped push me into that a lot quicker. Um, and so, yeah, it's actually been a blessing. Like I said, the, the way things have turned out the last few years 
the way the Facebook group, group has gone, the patients that have come to see me, I've started, I finally got enough where I was like, you know what, I think I can do this full time and not be a urologist anymore. Um, and it's not about the money. Like, we're taking a massive pay cut, actually. I mean, massive. You know, we're two employed urologists at a small hospital. I mean, we make really good guaranteed salary. You know, we don't have to worry about it. But this is not about that. And so we literally are we're selling our house. We bought some land in my around my hometown. We bought an RV, a travel trailer. Um, and I can't remember what you guys call them over there. Um, but that's what we're going to live in. What is, what are they? You know, you camper van. Camper van. Yeah. That's yeah. It. yeah. 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 That's it. Yeah. yeah. So we bought, we bought one of those and that's what we're going to live in. we kind of got, got all our debts paid off for the most part. And so we're just going to kind of see what happens. So, but for me, this, like I said, it's a passion. It's really about, I want to dive into this and see where we can take it as far as just because I can't give my patients what they need here when I'm still doing full-time urology all the time too. You know what I mean? We're on call. We're taking care of you know, people coming in bleeding from the penis and you got to deal with it. You know what I mean? Like it's, urology is kind of crazy. Some of the stuff we deal with. And then yet I got all these hormone guys and they're trying to get their messages through the patient portal and my nurse can't get to them for two weeks because we're dealing with urology stuff. And so it's a disservice to them, honestly. And, and so you have to choose at some point. And that's kind of another reason that I've gone this way. Yeah. Here's a question for both of you. Do you think the fact that you are on TRT has shaped the decisions that you've made? And I'll explain what I mean by that, because I haven't met any TRT experts, doctors, medical professionals that don't think this way, in that, that we are a holistic being. We need to address all of lifestyle. You know, we don't, we're critical thinkers. We, we see the whole picture. We don't just dole out medication. Is that because? we're on TRT, has that done something? Do you see what I mean? Or, or yeah. what came first? Were we that person anyway? So we would have chose TRT at the right, right time. Or has this helped in some way? For me, I think it amplified things that were already there. Um, my my genuine general personality type, like I said, I'm, I've always been a question asker. I don't just, I'm not a quote unquote authority follower. I mean, if you're a legitimate authority, sure, but most, people aren't um so i've always had those kind of like streams inside of me where i just like kind of buck the system and question why how do you know that how do you know that how do you know that um i think that combined with finally getting on testosterone to feel better and not feel just like a bump on a log that wants to sit in the chair all day um definitely trt has amplified that in me um and brought those passions kind of back to life to help me i think implement that and, I, and there is something to be said for being on the therapy that you're actually giving to some other person there's something to be said for that doesn't mean you have to be but when you've gone through it and you felt it and you know the feeling of low t and then you know you, you've been through different protocols and this has worked and this hasn't and you kind of people res it resonates with people when you start talking to them and and it just helps i mean it really does i mean max probably feels the same way um being on it and talking to patients i would assume i mean i i feel like most people feel like that yeah i think there's 100 percent. i think it's really helpful to have experienced i've said this before that i don't think obviously every doctor has to have all the conditions that they treat because otherwise they'd be they'd be sick as right. sick as anything but i definitely think it does help because i like you said about guys coming in and they maybe they've got some anxiety maybe they've got this that and the other and they 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 don't actually maybe believe it could be a testosterone issue then you look at their blood work and then you take the history and you say yes it can because you know lo and behold this was me two years ago but i think going back to the question as well from from ross is i think that is i would say i, I agree with jordan i think it amplifies what was already there for me i've always been fairly questioning I would say what the change for me as well was that that I don't think I was ever passionate about anything career wise until I until I went into this. I think I just kind of went through it step by step. You know, let's you know, I remember being sat at the table with my family and being like, I think I'll be a doctor. And then it was like med school. And then it was like GP looks all right. You know, mm -hmm. you earn well, you have to work, but you don't have to work full time. I'll do GP. And then it was when the when the, the low testosterone hit when TRT worked like a miracle over week, you know, I don't want to say miracle, but it worked amazingly over weeks into, you know, six months. And it was like life, the night and day changes. 
that's when it ignited the passion. But certainly the questioning nature, and you know, mentioned the last couple of years particularly, questioning narratives. And I think that comes partly from my family, but definitely was amplified amplified through TRT. Um, and I think when you've been through low testosterone and, you know, for, you know, I watched a lot of the, the TRT hormone optimization channel stuff and, and looked at the way they, they, they advise people to practice as well was that if you've been through it and you've been in that bad place, that's why you listen to these guys. That's why you give them the time because you realize that you might have a lot of anxiety at the start. You might have loads of questions. And unless you give someone an hour to just flush it out, and plus they don't know all of the, the you know, they haven't nerded it up for three years learning about what happens to, why is my FSH low? Why is my right. LH low? Right. Is that abnormal? You know, right. and you just got to give them time to actually understand it because it's, to them, it is a big, a big thing for us. Maybe we don't feel like it is because we've been on it. We understand the benefits. We understand the science, but because of partly because of the stigma, I think it's a big step to take for some guys. And if you can give them the time, then they can just understand and feel more comfortable. And that's, I think that's so much of it as well, isn't it? It's that psychological reassurance, I guess. hundred percent. You're, you're going to get a mixed bag of patients. You know, some that have already been like, I get tons that have been in the Facebook group and they're kind of, really research stuff so they already kind of know going in what they're kind of what to expect these are guys not on trt yet then you got the guys that have been on trt but they've been wrecked i have a ton of those that, that's probably where i got a lot of my patients were from guys who've been wrecked by other places and you kind of have to undo the damage and it's it's tricky and then you get the guys who don't know anything about it and their primary care sent them over for low t never even asked them if they were symptomatic and they just show up and you kind of got to just go through the whole thing. And then there's some on the fence where they're like, okay, I've kind of heard about this TRT thing. I've kind of, they read a little bit, they hear some bad stuff. They don't really know. They're like, I need you to just tell me what's really going on. What am I supposed to expect? And so those can be a little trickier. Sometimes they take a little longer if they're kind of like on that fence or they just really don't know a lot about it. They're just a normal working guy and they're, but they've, their bro or their friend has told them like, Hey man, you really want to maybe look into your, your testosterone. So yeah, it's a, it's a mixed bag. And um, something you said that was interesting, uh, Max was about the difference between like, no, you don't want to be a provider that has every ailment that your patient has, but there's a difference between what allopathic medicine does, which is basically symptom suppression and the guys on TRT providers like us, and, and being on it, that's a lifestyle thing. So it's like, you know, people see me and they go, oh, you're in shape and you work out. And I'm like, yeah, because I, I live out, I practice what I preach, right? Whereas, you know, that doesn't apply to all the things that like, like a GP does when you're just write a prescription for some high blood pressure and somebody that's not going to take care of themselves. It's not the same thing. You know what I mean? Whereas like, this is a different type of medicine, I would say. This, this hormone optimization space that's why I, I hold hormones in a separate category in my mind than pharma, even though they're pharmaceuticals, it's, it's, it's different. And I don't know how to, and that, and that may be arbitrary on my point. It's just in my mind, I do hold hormones and even peptides in a way in a separate category because you're sort of adding and doing these little things to amplify and make someone better and still hope that they take all that and use it in their life. Whereas throwing somebody on a, on metoprolol, is not going to make them go work out more. You know, it's actually going to make them not want to. It's going to give them erectile dysfunction. You know what I mean? Like so much of that crap just makes you worse. And then you end up taking 10 meds for the, to chase the, the effects of the one med that you started with. And that's not really how it works with TRT. I know some people will say that in this space. Oh, you got to take your AI, you know, because you're on testosterone now. And it's like, no, you don't. Or, oh, you got to take your HCG because of this, this, and this. Oh, it's going to destroy 50 upstream hormones. It's like, no, it doesn't. You can't show me a single paper that does that. You know, it was funny what you were talking about a minute ago. There is a guy, he's actually in, in the UK. Um, and so I had a, I have a fun that you were talking about. But yeah, we, we got into the wrangle dangle with him a few times um, mm -hmm. because he says, you know, you have to, it's like some crazy low dose of TRT and then you throw in HCG because that's really what, what counts. And it's like, it's, I just, there's no evidence for that. That's your protocol. Fine. But don't act like you have to do that. That is, that's what frustrates me. And that's the sign of a charlatan is when you start telling people dogmatically, it has to be this way when you don't have backup for that. 
I mean, you can be dogmatic. We all are dogmatic about what we believe and what we think we know, but usually we at least have some backup for that. But if you're just making it up out of thin air and, and then calling people names who don't agree with you, you're just a, a snake oil salesman at that point, you know? So anyway, that was a big spiel. I can go off about this stuff all day, man. I oh, love it. And that's a, that's a really nice kind of segue in, into the estrogen world and AIs. Like, where did it come from? Like why, why why did we think this was a good idea initially to take an anti-cancer medication? I think it was from the bodybuilding world, honestly. I think it was, and it, and that didn't happen. I don't think in the seventies. That I feel like that probably came about in the eighties. Um, because you can you can um I think there was this like people associate estrogen with with feminine, right? They just do, and and I think that became maybe in the late seventies. I'd have to go back and actually look into that when that kind of when people when do people start freely talking about hormones in like a colloquial way? I don't know, like. Oh, that guy needs some testosterone or, oh, he's, he's just acting like a woman. He's full of estrogen. Like you've heard people say that kind of stuff. Right. And we all said it. I, I mean, I probably said it when I was younger and you don't even think about it because it just becomes part of the culture. And I don't know where that started. Um, I'd love for somebody to do actually a deep dive on that make like a documentary. It'd be really cool. I'd watch it. Um, but I think in the eighties, you know, the bodybuilders, you started noticing they're taking more drugs and they want that perfect cosmetic effect on show day. And yeah, if you block estradiol, you know, then you are going to inhibit one essential hormone that does, you will get a little water from, from estradiol. I mean, it's not what people think it is, but they, you know, they'll also take diuretics to get rid of the water too. That doesn't mean we need to constantly be taking diuretics either, right? That's not a normal thing to do. So there's a difference between some, what somebody is doing to chase a desired effect for a, a pragmatic purpose versus what should you be doing when you're just doing this as a, a replacement dose or whatever, when you're not a performance enhanced athlete trying to go for a cosmetic appearance, right? If, if it's all just about cosmetics, you can inject your lips, you can inject your butt, you can take whatever you want. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff that that has nothing to do with hormone optimization. And so I think that was part of it. I think too, that people get and that. This is a more modern thing. And this is a pet peeve of mine. And a lot of people disagree with me on this. And I, I just say this to, spark some conversation and put a rock in somebody's shoe. We get so hung up on blood work um, that, sorry about that. We get so hung up on blood work that we miss the forest for the trees. We test so much crap that half of it, we don't even know what it means, right? Like I always tell people like, if you're going to check a lab, you need to be able to hundred percent know how was the meaning, the meaning you ascribed to that lab do you really know that's what it means? How is it validated to mean what you think it means? And most people don't have a clue. And I'll go so far to say, I don't even know 100% on a lot of things I still order. Like even SHBG, we, we make some claims. We kind of correlate some stuff with it. We don't really know what SHBG actually means for the patient. Um, but with estradiol, that's when I did the deep dive, right? It was after Dr. Ruzier's presentation. And he didn't touch on this one part that I finally, because I was like, I've got to know more about this. And that's why I made the, the one hour video on the TRT channel about why you shouldn't use aromatase inhibitors. And I linked all the papers are there in a Google Drive for people to read. And there was some guy that did some research in the 70s and he, it was on female hormones, but he was looking into DHEA. And um, he started getting into the conversion processes, right? So aromatization from DHEA into estradiol or androstenedione and all these things and into other compounds. And this, this applies to DHT as well, right? Testosterone to DHT. So anything that's being converted, you start reading the papers and realize, and it just dawned on me when he said it, that these conversion processes aren't just happening in the bloodstream, you know, because that's what you picture in your mind. You inject testosterone and poo, magically it's like converting to the estrogen fairy in your blood and then it just wreaks havoc on your body. That's not how it works. This is what's called an intracrine process. So intracrinology is what this guy was into. And I remember hearing intracrine from med school, and I think I'd just like forgotten about it. Um, but that means it's more of a localized process. So the way this works is you take your testosterone, it, get, it has to get into the tissues first, then it's converted to either estradiol or DHT. Well, what that means is that serum level that you're checking of estradiol is pretty much nearly useless because you're not getting tissue levels of that. Whereas testosterone, you're taking it, right? You're injecting it. It's being slowly released into the bloodstream. So you're trying to correlate symptoms with that serum level. That's okay. It's not the end all be all. 
because I'll still go off symptoms more than anything because there's, you know, androgen resistance thoughts and all this stuff. But DHT and estradiol, those blood markers are, are very much not nearly as useful as you think. And I started reading these papers that would even say it in the papers. They're like serum levels of estradiol in men and postmenopausal women are nearly useless. And I'm like, these are like academic papers. And they, these are the people that are actually researching this topic. And I'm like, so where did this come from? And so that's when I started asking people, like, why would you take an aromatase inhibitor based on a lab value that is not telling you what you think it is? And because your estradiol serum will always be above normal when you're taking testosterone, because taking testosterone is not natural. So, of course, your estradiol is going to be out of range. And that's another thing people don't understand. Lab ranges, those are not made for people on hormones. <laughs> those are made at baseline levels. Right. And they get this range and then you get standard deviations. But once you start taking an exogenous substance, all that pretty much goes out the window. So all the government governing agencies and regulatory bodies say, oh, once they get above this level, we got to cut. Off. It's like it doesn't matter because that range was not made for people on testosterone replacement or estradiol, whatever. So that to me was just like a light bulb moment, you know, four years ago when we made that video, like this intracrine process with estradiol and DHT as well that changes everything. That means if you're going to claim that I need to take a poison, which is what an aromatase inhibitor is, okay? The same thing with finasteride and 5 -L These are, by definition, if you look up what a poison is, you know, Merriam-Webster dictionary definition, that's what these are. They inhibit a naturally occurring process in the body, okay? Uh, aromatization is a natural process. We're made that way. It's important. Um, so if you're going to tell me I need to take a poison, that I know can cause some cardiovascular issues and osteoporosis and a lot of erectile dysfunction and brain fog, you better darn well have some evidence for that. And nobody does. And that started sticking out to me because I'd start hammering a lot of these people and going, how do you know that? Give me some evidence. And they just like repeat some rhetoric that they'd heard. I'm like, rhetoric is not evidence. Like I need, I need well done studies and they have to be well done. I don't want petri dish crap. I don't. I don't want what you're growing cells in a petri dish, and you're just doing stuff to them, and you're measuring some chemicals. That's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with human physiology, and so anyway, that that became a big passion of mine to talk about that topic because I saw the benefits of stopping the aromatase inhibitor for myself. I put some patients on it when their estradiol got like over a hundred, and they got worse, and I was like this is not what I've been reading. You know, like, you know, you watch some of the guys on, on YouTube back in the day, you know, 10 years ago, like Rand McLean and some of these guys like, Oh yeah, you got to keep your estradiol between 20 and 30. And I was like, Oh, okay. You know, you just believe it when you don't know any better. And so I was trying to keep these ranges low at first and guys, and finally I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm just going to raise this testosterone dose and see what happens instead of putting it on a throat. And lo and behold, it gets better. And I was like, Okay, so that was sort of the early light bulb moment. And then once I started looking into it here, I'd get guys from all over who wanted to come off the aromatase inhibitors, but were scared to death to do it because they were being filled with fear. They were going to grow boobs, right? Like, it's so rare to get gynecomastia on TRT. I don't know. I don't know that I have a single patient who didn't already have gynecomastia from steroid use who's developed gynecomastia from TRT. I have actually had a guy come to me in his 70s with gynecomastia we put him on testosterone cream. I said, I will bet you money when we get your free testosterone higher, it will regress your growth. And it did. And so people just blows their mind that you're saying taking more testosterone, is going to actually regress. I'm like, it can, you know, because gyno is not simply about estrogen. It's it's really a ratio and a balance, a balance thing. And plus, it's there's other factors, you know. So anyway, that's my big tangent on the aromatase inhibitor thing. It's been, you know, I've given talks, you know, about that. Uh, the one on online, I'm actually... It's probably going to cause a stir. I'm going to talk on November 2nd or 3rd at the Mr. Olympia uh, with their little, they're having like a hormone round table. Finally, they're starting to do some longevity stuff, which I think is great. And I think I'm going to give my estradiol talk and there'll probably be a lot of, you know, <laughs> people won't like it, but that's okay. Excellent. That, that was fascinating. I Yeah. Do you think a lot of it as well comes down to, you mentioned it there about the blood results, almost if you are on TRT, the chances are your estradiol will be out of the range that we give from the labs. I, I think because I think a lot of a lot of patients who transfer to us, they're on an AI and 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 you look at their estradiol and oh and often it's actually what makes me feel uncomfortably it's low, like it's low. Um, 
But I do wonder how much of it is, is just the doctor gets the blood results back. The estradiol is outside of it. So it comes back red. And we yep. know in medicine, <laughs> red, yep. red means like, oh my gosh, this is bad. Even yep. though we can have the testosterone in the red. That's it's, right. Exactly. It's CRP. But yep. estradiol red is, you know, this guy's going to retain fluid. He's going to, you know, he's going to get gyno. He's going to, I don't know, he's going to complain of crying when he watches Grey's Anatomy, which mm. I did with Loti. But like, <laughs> it's like, you know, oh, it's, I probably still would cry at Grey's Anatomy. But like, yeah. you know, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 I think it's a lot of blood test medicine, isn't it? And yeah. when you, and exactly like you said, and this is what I try and explain to people is the blood result is what's leaked out from when it's been made. That's so, right your body will find homeostasis on TRT that that level may well be outside of what we consider to be normal on a lab result. This lab result is not based on TRT guys. Yep. And if you, if you even look at the lab result, you have to just remember that the lab result is not what's going on in the tissue. Right. So it's, but I think a lot of it is lab lab result medicine. So I could rant about that for an hour and I won't, it, it is absolutely lab result medicine. And that is, the reason it's lazy, I'm going to just say that, and it's what most practitioners do. And it, because they're taught that, it's not that they're being nefarious about it. Um, I see it every day, right? I see people come in and, and I had a guy this week, my patient on testosterone, uh, my primary care checked my estrogen and it was high. So she gave me an aromatase inhibitor. And I'm going like, what, why? Why? First of all, why didn't you call me? But second of all, that's all that that's it. She just checked it and she doesn't know anything about estradiol metabolism or, or, or biochemistry or any of this stuff, but they just do it. She's also a pellet pusher, right? Like, so whatever. Um, but it is absolutely, and this goes beyond hormones, the lab obsession. And I call it an obsession with data because people love data. We all love it, right? We want to track it. We want to put it in a spreadsheet. We want to have hard data. Data has to be interpreted, and the interpretation is what's the question here, right? This is a philosophical issue. This is what does that data mean, and how did you validate it? So if you can't tell me that, then you might want to pause, go start looking into some papers and try to figure out, do even the researchers know what that data means? Because half the time, they don't. So like you will find research papers from neurology and all these other places where they will actually test serum estradiol, and based on a level, they'll say this cohort needs an aromatase inhibitor or something. And you're like, that level doesn't mean anything because you obviously didn't look into the intricate process going on. Right. So you have to backtrack all these papers. And that's what I do with this. So because I'm obsessive, if you see a claim in a paper and it's got a footnote, it's got a little number by it. That means they linked the paper. Right. You go read that paper and find out if what they're saying is validated by that paper, that foundational paper. I would bet <laughs> you eight times out of 10, it's not. You can't find that. You're going to find that so much stuff in medicine and in quote unquote science is rhetoric that somebody wrote in a paper one time and that became a fact and, and just went into the, everything else. It's, it's, it's actually kind of terrifying. Um, but I think we can do our due diligence. And it doesn't mean we're going to figure all this out. Like we're not, I'm not doing bench research, right? But I can read papers and I can go, that was never validated. Like, so we got to figure this out on our own now. Wait, let's actually figure out what to do with these guys or whatever. But I think with the estrogen issue, I've done it enough now. I've undone the damage like with people and gotten them off their AIs enough. And every now and then you're going to find an, an outlier. You are going to find some guy that just, just swears he's got to have just a I need a quarter of an Arimidex every two weeks. I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. Every two weeks? Like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? Like, it's just crazy. But a lot of these guys, if you just get them to overcome their fear of the lab, that alone will help them realize that it's about symptoms and how I feel. I need to trust the process. I might need a little more testosterone. And, and the sad part is most physicians won't let them go above that number right and so they never know that they could feel better and that's what some guys for me are just amazed they're like you don't you're not freaking out when my testosterone's 1500 i'm like why would i freak out mine's 1700 you know like why would i freak out at that so i think that gives them a little ease when they hear like oh he's he's doing this and he's okay with it i'm like yeah because i'm I, I practice what i preach i'm not going to be a hypocrite i refuse um that is one thing i'm passionate about is like if i'm making these claims and i feel they're true that's, that's what I'm going to do. You know? So if you come to me saying, I really think I need an aromatase inhibitor. And I'm like, you, you got the wrong guy, you know, like, and, and same thing with finasteride for hair loss. I'm not going to do it. Like 
I get it. Some guys tolerate it in low doses and they don't have any issues. But from a general health perspective, it's not healthy. You're better off using something topical, if, if anything. You know, even then you get some systemic absorption. But taking taking these things, I tell people it's like taking a nuke, you know, to a city to take out an anthill. Like it's it, the systemic effects, like you're, you're poisoning your whole body. You're not just targeting, even if it was estradiol in just the breast tissue, taking a aromatase inhibitor affects it everywhere in your bones and your blood vessels and your penis and like all these places it's needed, your brain. Why would you do that? You know what I'm saying? Like, and, but people don't really think about that stuff. They just want the immediate, like, I just want this gone or I want to fix this number or whatever. So I think we got to talk people off the ledge quite a bit and then just kind of reroute some of the way they're thinking about this stuff. And for me anyway, that's helped me to start thinking about it. <coughs> a little better so yeah i was I, I think we could probably talk here for about another three weeks good yeah um i'd love to get you back on again and talk about the whole validation of papers i think that would be super interesting yeah. and I'll also <laughs> dive into hcg because that was something that was kind of sold to me when i when i changed provider a few years ago you know this is the gold standard everybody needs it yeah um so yeah, I'd love to maybe get you back on if you're open to that. Yeah. Um, in another few months when you've settled in, your clinics yeah. going through the roof. <laughs> I'd love it, man. Cause yeah, the HCG and then the fertility side, right? I could I could do a whole talk on like the guys that are pulled off their testosterone and try to regain or maintain fertility. And it's not really necessary. And so there's some protocols that can help with that. And so um, I think it's important for other providers to know about that. So they don't have to just rip people off their testosterone and make them feel like crap when they're trying to have a baby. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love that. Yeah. Um, Max, Jordan, it's been an incredible episode. Thank you so much for both joining us. Absolutely. Um, Thank you, Jordan. Jordan actually, are, you, are you talking at the Silverlink? At Silverlink, the Silverback Summit? Yeah, Silverback. I don't know if I'm doing a talk this year. I did a talk last year where there's so many new people. Like Ali's gotten like, it's awesome. You know, we've gotten these great speakers. So I think we're going to do more round table type stuff to get everybody kind of, and, and it may get heated. It may not. I don't know. Cause there's, there's a lot more uh, thought there, but i talked last year at it and uh, that's where I did give the estradiol presentation. It was, it was very well received. I mean, guys loved it. They were like, and they had good questions, you know, but yeah, we'll be at the silverback. Um, I'll be there the week after the Mr. Olympia. Um, and so do y'all know, um, you know, the, are y'all going at all? You're probably not traveling over here. Yeah, yeah, we're coming. Oh, well, there you go. So I'll see you that you guys there. So yeah, yeah. And then and how do people reach out to you? What's the best place for them if they if they've watched this? Where do they find you? The new uh well, honestly, if they're in Facebook and they want to be part of the TRT and hormone optimization group, it's not my group, but it's a great group to join. Just make sure you answer the questions. Um, but my new website for our hormone clinic is granthormone.com. And anybody that's, you know, inquiring, we just have them fill out the contact button. And then I've been emailing, I'm doing all the work. So I'm emailing every day, everybody individually and trying to get them, you know, enrolled and ask questions. And I love it though, because it, it's ours now, you know, we own it. So it's cool. Yeah. Brilliant. So Awesome, man. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much. Have a great day, guys. Y'all too. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Alpha Genics Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss next week's episode. For more resources on Alpha Genics and men's health, visit alphagenics.co.uk. Until next time.